Okay guys, it's actually a couple days later. It's uh, Monday the 15th, but um, I was putting up part three, or editing part three of my Mechanical Room series, and since I split that whole hour plus video that I made into three smaller chunks, I know I had promised I would do a, an electrical system overview, so I thought I would come down and record this. I pulled the cover off my um, box here that I bought, and this is 120 volts in there, and it is on, so I'll, uh, I'll carefully point to things, but um, I did not step anything down for this system. You can use 24 volts if you want to get a transformer and you want to step it down, and then you can get 24 volt aquastats. Um, you can get 24 volt valves. In fact, I think these Bolimo valves are variable and that they'll take anything from 24 up to 240 volts. At least this one will. I don't know about these, but uh, you can order all that stuff in 24 volts. For me, it was just easier to just stick with 120. So what I did before I even mounted the heaters here, I had the plan of you know, basically having switches from my phone that will turn on and off the systems as I need it. So when I wired these outlets on the wall, coming out of the breaker box, uh, the very last breaker down here um, is the utility room. Okay, actually, yeah, it should be this wall. And uh, it comes down, something tells me it's... Uh, a different breaker but um, anyway comes down and no I think it is and it's actually only a 15 I actually thought it was a 20 so I'm, I'm actually only on a 15 amp breaker it's never it's never tripped so everything you see here except for that outlet down there this is all on the same breaker so it goes to show you how little they really draw because I mean if it was that big of an amp pull it would trip the breaker and it, it's never it doesn't get close and I've done the math I've added up what each unit draws what each pump draws and you know I've done the math and it's under but anyway comes out of the panel box it goes right into this first outlet here and this is a GFI okay and it goes into this first and then out into this outlet that's next to it here okay and then it jumps over to here and then it jumps over to here and so what I did was coming out from this first outlet, all of these are on all the time. So here I ran the power coming in. I broke the tab on the hot side of the outlet so that the top is on all the time and the bottom is on this switch. Same thing here. The top is on all the time the bottom is controlled by the switch okay so the heaters get power all the time and I don't really have a way to shut those off unless the GFI trips or I shut the breaker or I unplug them uh, there is a power switch on the actual transformer in the units that you can shut these things off but I also can turn them off I mean just by pushing the button on the control panel you can shut them off um, and you'll hear them they you know when you do that they turn off so you know I, I've never really had a need to turn them off uh, if you do change some of the dip switch settings in there like for the vent length and that sort of stuff which I can do another video on the venting and all of that and if I start uploading all the old videos I have you'll see I took video when I installed all this venting and how I did it and why I did it certain ways and everything so you'll see that but um, anyway then for the switches, I used, I think they're those GE um, compatible with Samsung Smart Things switches. They're just they're just light switches. They're like 25, 30 bucks a piece. I got them on Amazon, tied them into my Smart Things, and I can turn on and off the switches from my phone. So from there, I could have done one or two things and I actually might go back and rewire this over the summer and change it but for now to get it up and running uh, back in January I decided to bring a power cord so I took a molded computer power cord that I had laying around here and I cut the end off and these are 14 gauge so they're they're decent size wire and 
the snow melt I brought up over into that bundle and it comes right into the bottom of the aquastat and from there it does two things so that wire coming into that aquastat is hot all the time as long as that snow melt switch is on okay so whenever that snow melt switch is on I want a couple of things to happen I want there always to be power to this pump so as that wire enters into this aquastat I split it off and it always provides power to the input side of the aquastat and it always provides power to this pump so as long as the switch is on the pumps running the the zone pump that's circulating the driveway same thing with the radiant same exact setup then I, I took a 16 gauge four wire tray cable that I bought online and that's this other wire here so this has four wires in it the one coming in only has three hot neutral and ground the one coming out has four now the one coming out I took one of the wires on coming out and also hooked it to the hot side so whenever the snow melt or radiant but for now you know the snow melt switches on i've got 120 volts coming into this box it powers the aquastat it powers this pump and it sends a signal back to this box and it comes back hot on the black wire okay and i'll get to this in a second so then i thought you know i might want a way for testing and filling and doing some other things I might want a way to have the zone on without the pump running so I got some switches and that's what these switches are on the front of these things so if I turn that off I can still turn the snow melt on and the aquastat will function like normal and you know it'll come on which Right now, I mean, I probably could turn the snow melt on. And that's probably going to be 60, 65, 68 degrees. So it's above 65 and it's less than 80. So it's not going to turn on the primary pump or anything. And because that switch is off, this is not circulating. So it's not bringing that cold glycol back to where this aquastat can see, you know, the sensors up there on the return but it, it can't see it so it'll just sit here you know and, and I did that for testing I did that for you know I just thought it'd be nice to have these switches here to be able to control these pumps if I turn this switch on it's gonna turn that pump on okay turn it off it turns it off so I do leave that on um, I'm gonna turn the snow melt back off and I'll turn that back on so that way if I do turn the system on remotely from work from you know somewhere else that's not I'm not here I can fire up the snow melt and everything's gonna come on like I want it to come on so I normally leave these on these two are off because I was doing some testing the other night and uh, playing with the radiant still dialing things in but um, anyway on the output side of the aquastat okay so when this aquastat drops below 65 degrees and it closes a couple of things happen on the output side now 120 volts is sent to this valve which opens the valve to allow it to to come out of bypass mode and go back okay and that's just a two wire cable there's just a hot and a neutral in there these aren't even grounded surprisingly okay and then out of the other three cables left in this 14 wire cable there's a neutral, there's a ground, and there's um, a hot. And the, and the other hot is only energized when the aquastat is closed. Okay, so hopefully that makes, makes sense. I can draw it out and maybe put a picture up. I can try in the video. Um, but anyway, so each of these zones are wired exactly the same. You got 120 volts coming in from the switch. If the switch is on, You've got power going to your pumps because these pumps run continuous circulation all the time. They modulate themselves. They're variable speed. They, they have their own, you know, they're great. So, and then 
I have a hot wire that also rides back on that 16.4, and then the other three wires coming out are all, all the neutrals are tied together, and all the grounds are tied together. So for each zone. So the grounds and the neutrals are all just wire nutted. I soldered everything even before putting wire nuts on. You know, there's no breaking up the neutrals or anything. The neutrals, the grounds are all just connected in there if it has a ground. These pumps are grounded. Uh, these valves are not grounded. They just have a hot and a neutral. The aquastats, I don't know. I don't remember now if the aquastats have a grounding screw on them or not. But um, I know they definitely have a hot and a neutral. But... Yeah, so really, all I'm interrupting here is, is the 120 volts. So anyway, each of the three zones has a 16-gauge four-wire tray cable that comes back into this box, okay? And the black wire is what is hot when the switch is on. That's the one that rides back. It's on all the time. As long as that either one of these switches is on, there is hot 120 volts coming back on the black wire from that zone okay the red wire that comes back from each one and, and hits here that is the wire that's only energized when the aquastat is calling for more heat when the, when the aquastat closes that contact to turn on the pumps and the valves 120 volts is also sent back to this box on the red wire. Blue is my neutral and green is my ground. Uh, well, orange, sorry, orange is the, is the ground. So what I did here was the, the problem that you that I had was normally if you only had one zone, you could just have that output coming out of that aquastat go right to power that pump and just turn the pump on whenever you know whenever the zone needs heat just turn on the primary loop pump and you can just connect the 120 volts right to that pump and you're good to go the problem i have is that because i have three zones here like i mentioned i think in part two you don't want to have one zone activating the pump and calling for more heat and more heat and more heat and have the other two open. So if you just tied the output on all three of these, the output of the aquastat and ran all three of them together to that pump, you could do that. But the problem is whenever any one of them calls and closes, that whole side of, of the 120 volts is going to be energized and it's going to back feed back and it's going to open these valves because they're all on the output side if that makes sense like without the relays all the hots would be connected together at the pump so that any one of these could control the pump but when any one of them is on yes the pump's going to be on but so are the wires going back to the aquas to the output side of the aquastats and you can do that but these valves are also connected to the output side of the aquastats okay so anytime any one of these is on, all of them are going to be on. And you don't want that because now you're just dumping heat into zones because they're, these pumps are always on, they're continuous circulation. You're always going to be adding heat to those zones when you don't want it. So to isolate that, you use 120 volt, these RIB or RH1B relays. So I can do a separate video also on these relays and how to wire them um, but just to give you guys a quick overview so in order to isolate each of those three zones so that whenever one of them comes on it doesn't turn on the other two you run it through a relay and basically this relay has these two terminals here at the top these are 13 and 14 I believe are the numbers and you have your neutral and you have your hot coming out of the aquastat. So in other words, whenever the aquastat closes over there and says, I need more heat, power is applied to this red wire coming in, the one on the left, you can see here, right? The one on the left, and this is all off right now, but, and then neutral is on the other side. 
So it basically apl applies power to this side of the relay and it closes the contacts for the other side. So if you look at the top, these are all daisy chained, one to the next to the next, and they just come in right from this cord. So there is 120 volt power right now, hot, coming into that screw in the back there where the brown wires are, okay? But there is not any power coming out of the bottom here. And if I grab the voltmeter, you would see that this is dead because none of these relays are closed because none of the aquastats are calling and they can't be calling because they're off. Okay, so on the output side of the relay, when, when it's closed, you can also see these are daisy chained together. So it doesn't matter which one of these three are calling, it will send power back down to that pump over there. Okay, so you'll also notice that from this power line here coming out of that switch the neutral just gets passed right through to the pump and the ground just gets passed right through to the pump so the neutral and the ground are going basically right from here through there and over to that pump the hot is controlled by the relay so if one relay if any one of these three relays is calling it will turn on that pump however if neither of the other two are calling this the the power cannot get back across the relay and go back out to the red wire to turn on the other zones. So they're isolated, okay? Now, another thing that I did was you'll notice the black wire that comes back from the Aquastat that I said earlier on has 120 volts on it any time that these switches are on. Well, I put a switch in and jumped over to the outlet side of the aquastat. And what that does is it applies 120 volts to the output side of the aquastat. So it basically overrides the aquastat. So no matter what the aquastat is reading, no matter if it needs heat, if it doesn't need heat, and you know, if I could like right now I have, excuse me, the snow melt set to 80, it could be coming back 82, 83, 84. Normally this would shut off. I don't need heat anymore. But if 120 volts is being applied to the outlet side of the aquastat, the valve's gonna stay open and the pump's gonna stay on, okay? So this is an easy way for me for filling. Um, you know, when I was filling the system, you want, you, I need these valves to be open when I'm filling it because you can't really fill it and get the air out, you know, with the pump and purge if, if it's closed. So what I would do is turn on the, the zone, like turn on the snow melt. Okay, which is now turning on that, but I turned it off. And then to open the Aquastat, I would go ahead and flip this switch. Now, if I flip this switch right now, it's going to bypass the Aquastat. Even though that Aquastat is at 68, it's not calling right now because it's not below 65. But if I flip that switch, it's gonna fire that pump and it's gonna turn on the heaters because I'm overriding the Aquastat. So what I can do is turn off the power for the pump side of the relay. Okay, so now that pump cannot fire because there's no power being provided to the relays through those brown wires, so it's off. Now I can flip this, and really all it's gonna do is start to open up the Belimo valve, the three-way valve. Okay, which really isn't doing anything right now because, you know, there's no power to the pump, and, you know, so, turn that off. So hopefully that makes makes sense to you guys. Um, and then this is just an extra one I put in here. What I might do is run this through a relay. The other cool thing that a, a good friend of mine uh, taught me, who I can put his a link to his channel too down in the description. But um, Jeff, if you're watching this, uh, he he taught me how to wire a lot of this. I, I was kind of familiar with relays, but not to this point and. He brought up an excellent point that by doing this this way, the aquastats never really see the amperage and the wattage of the pump. So normally, like, like this pump, the way this one's wired right now, 
power goes into the aquastat, it comes out of the aquastat, and it goes right to the tank pump. So when that aquastat closes that circuit, this circuit board or the built-in relay in that aquastat is seeing the full draw of that pump. Whereas with any of these three aquastats, all, all they see is the little three watts that it takes to close these contacts. The relay is handling the load of taking the power from here and sending it to the pump. So these relays are rated for, I forget, 10 amps, 15 amps, something like that. So it, nothing, I mean, these, I think these draw two. So I'm not even close, you know, anyway, but still it's, it's nice for these aquastats that they only get to see the very, very small wattage of the relays. They don't see the load of the pump at all. So if anything, it'll just increase their longevity. That's all on how long they last. So I was thinking over here, I might do the same thing and just run this one through a relay just so it saves me, you know, the, the harshness or the, the beating on that aquastat, which I mean, really it's, it's probably fine. But, uh, the other thing I was going to do before I got the snow melt up was I was thinking it would be nice if as long as the heaters are already on and running why not just keep the tank up to temperature so i was going to buy like a delay on and a delay off relay and mount them in here on this din rail and have the tank circulate as long as the heaters were on because i don't want like the heaters run for 10 minutes they're off for 10 minutes they're on for 10 minutes or whatever that cycle is and then all of a sudden in there the tank comes on and then comes off and you're you just why if the heaters are already on it's like a car going down the highway right just why not let it run for an extra minute and recirculate the tank but what i found is it's automatically doing that anyway just because of the way that it's piped like i showed you guys um actually i don't know if i've uploaded that one yet but it's coming um i took like a startup video of the valentine's day um the 13th and 14th we had a snowfall and i did a startup and a shutdown video so i'll probably post that That'll be the next video I post after this one. But that shows you how when the snow melts on, it actually is already slowly circulates this tank and it brings this, it keeps this tank at like 138 degrees. So the tank pump will really never fire unless there's a really big draw on it, which there usually isn't. So anyway, um, yeah, I'm going to, uh, I've got everything off there. I'm going to turn this back on. I'm going to turn the pump power back on and now we're ready to go. So we're expecting, we have a winter storm warning for tonight. It is now 2.04. They're saying it's supposed to start around 7. We've already got a light dusting on the driveway, but I haven't turned it on yet. Um, honestly, I mean, yes, ideally I would like to preheat the slab before a storm, but what I found as far as the YouTube content is... Um, it's kind of boring for you guys to sit there and just watch a wet concrete slab. You know, people want to see it melting. So what I've been doing is actually waiting until the driveway gets a little bit of snow on it and then turning it on so you guys can watch it melt, you know, and I can speed up the time lapse and everybody seems to like those videos. So, um, that's probably what I'm going to do, but I do think because we're expecting 15 inches, um, between seven tonight and noon tomorrow. So I do want to give the driveway a, a running chance at that. So I probably around four o'clock, maybe even three 30. Um, I will probably turn this on and get it going. There is a little bit of snow out there so you can see it melt, but, um, yeah, I don't want to wait too late and have there be four inches, five inches on the driveway that it's got to try to keep up with. I'd rather it get a fighting chance from the start. So shortly here, I'm probably going to, turn this on and go set the camera up for a good another you know 12 14 18 hour time lapse and uh we'll go from there but yeah that's pretty much the electrical system um like i explained with this aquastat down here i keep that at 110 when it drops below 105 it turns on that recirc pump which then recirculates water from the tank out through the three-way mixing valve up to the mantle block and then down and back so the other thing i don't know if i mentioned in part one or part two i forget now is 
the three-way mixing valve. So underneath there is a three-way mixing valve. And the reason for that is I've got 135, even you know at some points if the snow melts on, 138 degree water in that tank. And that's pretty hot. You know, I have two kids here and the last thing I want is them turning on a hot water faucet and getting burned. So I turn that three-way mixing valve down. I think I have it set at like 110, 115 right now. And it's plenty hot enough upstairs for us. But I think at 120, in order to get burned at that temperature, I mean, it, they'd have to hold their hand under it for like three minutes or something crazy. So, um, yeah, I keep it. I keep the, the hot water going out to the house at a fairly lower rate, you know, 110, 115 degrees. So right now, because it's Monday, it's actually President's Day. It's a it's a holiday. Um, I'm home today, but my schedule thinks I'm at work, and that's why this is off right now. So around 4 o'clock, it will turn on that pump and recirculate the hot water. So it just doesn't know that today's a holiday. You know, I didn't program that into smart things. But since we are here, I can turn it on. And once that boots up, it's definitely going to be cold because it hasn't been on since probably 8 o'clock this morning. Yeah, it's reading 95. So it's turning on the recirculation pump. So the tank is at 132. And it really doesn't take long. Um, to get that 132 degree water in that tank through this loop and back. I did notice insulating made a big difference, so I do have to continue to insulate all these lines. I have all the insulation up there. I just haven't uh, had a chance to do it. So this is still on. We're up to 100, 101, 2, 3. So I must have it set to 108, I can see. So I have it set to 108 with a three degree differential. So, and as you can see, it keeps climbing even though it stopped. So it's 116 now. So right now this is 116 degrees inside this hot water pipe, which pretty much means it's 116 degrees like right here where it tees in. So. Anytime you turn on any one of these fixtures in the house, all you, all really all you have to do is wait for it to just purge the cool, cooler water through this one individual half inch puck line right to that fixture. And it's we found that even the furthest fixture away, it takes like eight seconds, and you have 120 degree hot water. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much. How it works and as you can see the tank is is still at 132 so that's what i mean about how efficient it is you know we basically just took 95 degree water that was in that line and recirced it for 40 seconds and put it back in the tank but it really hasn't phased the tank so anyway um that's kind of the end of the mechanical room series here if there's anything in addition that you guys want to see or if you have any comments i'd love to hear them um like subscribe you know do all that fun stuff if you want more and yeah it's been fun i i'm i'm proud of of this system um so far it's been working great and uh it's been handling our domestic hot water now for four months and it we haven't it hasn't hiccuped once and then it does the snow melt and everything else like you guys have seen from the videos it handles it like a champ so yeah, I would call this a success. There are, um, some of you might ask about manually turning on the system. They do make controls for that. Um, and I did spend the $100 for the Tecmar socket that's out in the slab. I can show you guys a picture. I'll, I'll throw a picture of that in the video here, but that was only a hundred bucks and then you run the conduit into the basement so right up here i don't know if you guys can see this there's a couple of holes there one of them runs out for electrical to the other side of the driveway and the other one goes to that sensor so what i could do if i wanted to at some point 
is purchase like the Tecmar six fifty four, whatever it is. Like they they make a um, automatic snowmelt control, and there's a sensor that you buy that you put in the slab. You right now it's just got a cap on it. You take that cap off, you put that sensor in, and that sensor senses surface temperature of the driveway. It senses um moisture so if it snows it knows that there's snow on the sensor and it will turn on the system you can do all sorts of stuff like preheat the slab if there's a storm um the one i was looking at didn't have wi-fi capability but they do have one now that does but guys the sensor alone for the driveway is like 500 bucks and then the controls the non Wi Fi controls right now are like another five hundred dollars. If you want the ones with Wi Fi, they're like a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks, I think, to be able to like go on your phone and put it in storm mode and have it you know, there are some benefits. It it will keep the slab temperature at a certain degree, but I'm kind of doing that now with the Aquastat. You know, a degree an aquastat setting of 80 on the return pretty much keeps that slab temperature at a certain degree if i lower this aquastat by one degree it pretty much lowers the surface temperature of the driveway by one degree once you figure out what that is right now for me with this set to 80 it's about a 45 degree surface temperature on the driveway so if i think that's too hot i could turn this down a little bit and it will lower the the temperature of the slab but you know, for me, for DIY and this whole thing, I just haven't seen the need yet to spend a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars on controls for this. It would be nice for those snowfalls that you get overnight when I'm sleeping and I'm not awake and watching enough to turn it on, and then you wake up and oh, there's snow on the driveway, like you know. But a dusting or whatever, who cares? I turn it on when I leave for work. And as you've seen in some of the, I think the second video, the second time-lapse video, um, I think the one that's labeled like first snowfall, second run, I turned it on. We, we got up one morning and there was snow on the slab. I turned it on and went to work. And like by 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, it was gone. So, you know, yes, if I had the automatic controls, it might have sensed that it was snowing at 11 p.m. and turned it on. And then by the time I came down in the morning, it would have been gone. But, I, you know, usually when, when there's a major snow event like what we're about to get, 15 inches, I know it's coming. And if that's the case, where if, if this storm we're supposed to get now here in a couple of hours was going to hit at midnight, I would just turn it on at 9 before I went to bed. Like what's the extra dollar 50 to run it for three more hours you know what i mean like so anyway i did put the socket in the slab because you only get one chance to do that you can't go back and add the sensor socket later on and that for a hundred bucks in the grand scheme of things i thought that was reasonable but i have not gone to the length of putting all the automatic controls in i've thought about it and you know who knows i probably could mount the little sensor that if i went with the manual one they have a little screen that says melt and it has storm mode i probably could put that like right in the front of this box um you know just right here on the front and do that but um yeah as of right now i just can't i can't bring myself to spend that kind of money when it works great literally turning it on and off from my phone i mean that's i haven't had any problems with that if you were putting this somewhere where the homeowner or the customer wasn't so conscious about it and you run the risk of them forgetting and leaving it on for days, then you have an issue where, you, you know, you, you might want to think about some sort of automatic control because that could really add up if, if somebody forgot about this. But for me, for these units, I'm so involved with what's going on here. There's, I can tell you there's pretty much a zero chance of me leaving, quote unquote, forgetting and leaving this on for days on end and burning gas. It's just not, it's just not going to happen. So anyway, um, I'm going to end this here. This should end the whole mechanical room series. And uh, yeah, let me know if there's anything else you guys want to see and I'll keep posting videos. I'm really going to try to grow the channel with this sort of stuff. So, yeah, anyway, thanks for watching.